Welcome back, AP. I'm so aggravated right now. I literally just talked at my computer for about 15 minutes to do y'all's flip and realized I had never hit the record button. Um, so, I hope it's as good as the last one because the last one would have been money. Um, go figure that that kind of stuff happens, right? But whatever, it's fine. I'm going to keep getting after it. It's not a big deal. I'm not going to let it hold me down. Uh, so, let's talk about nation building in Prussia, right? So, We've already come off the heels of talking about the nationalism movement in Italy under Garibaldi and Cavour and Victor Emmanuel and the idea of, like, we're going to start up here and down here and meet in the middle and don't piss off the Pope, right? So we talked about all that stuff. Now we're getting into the nationalism movement in Prussia. So we already went, wrote this down yesterday, talking about the Zollverein, the Customs Union, the idea that a unified Germany had started way, way before all this. Like in 1834, the seeds of nationalism in Germany had already long been planted, right? So, out of the 1848 revolutions, the chaos of 1848, where over 70 different revolutions broke out all over the continent, uh, the Prussian uh, government is going to develop a very small parliament with an upper and a lower house, right? So much like ours that has an upper house being the Senate and the lower house, the House of Representatives, they are actually going to develop a small little parliament and kind of develop what you could consider kind of a liberal state, right? An idea that uh, the Kaiser is going to be under slight bits of control from this parliament, right? There's going to be voting rights. There's going to be a lot of different stuff. But Wilhelm I, Wilhelm Hohenzollern, was actually inspired by the national revolts in Italy, inspired by the unification of the Zollverein, inspired by all these things to say, you know what? We need to nationalize too. There can be a German state. There can be a German empire even. He has these dreams of it, right? So he wants to nationalize though because he realizes the number one thing he's going to have to do is kick all these Europeans out of the German Confederation. Write that down somewhere. The German Confederation was loosely controlled by other European powers. You've got Denmark all up in your business. You've got Austria all up in your business. You've got France all up in your business. So he says, we need to double the size of the army by raising taxes. Well, the parliament, though, is mostly made up in the, Ger in the German state right now out of mostly middle-class liberal citizens. And liberals hate a lot of different things. They hate militarism. They hate no suffrage. They hate voting rights only for property owners. They hate raising taxes to try and finance wars. They hate crowns, right? Liberals don't like crowns. Liberals like the idea that a constitutional government rules over everything that is voted on by the people. So what he decides to do, Wilhelm I anyway, decides that just like Emmanuel elected Cavour, I'm going to let my own guy, Otto von Bismarck, as Chancellor of Germany, right? These two guys, but mostly this guy, is going to unite Germany together in grandiose fashion, right? Now, speaking of they did it anyway, that's what they're going to do. They are going to raise taxes anyway without the consent of the parliament. They're going to raise taxes. They're going to double-size the military, and they're going to do it because they said, you know what? I feel like it. So anyway, this guy right here, Otto von Bismarck, do not write this or this. Just write these two, okay? Now I'm also changing the title to, like, cross out Prussian unification, but Bismarck's unification, right? So he probably is one of the most important people in all of German history. When you rank the top three, it goes, now some of y'all are going to get a little skeeved out because I said Adolf Hitler is important in their history. Well, he is. He's the most number one groundbreaking game changer in a negative fashion in German history, right? And then you got Otto von Bismarck right here and then Martin Luther underneath him, right? Those are like if you're big top three guys, okay? So, a lot of people dis debate this, though. Hero or villain, right? Some historians believe he's a villain because he tries to go over the head of the liberal class, right? Come here, baby. And a lot of other people believe that he's actually a hero. Like Mr. D'Antonio, for example, believes that Bismarck is a straight-up hero. Give me that baby. Mm. So, he actually, like, is, I consider him to be a very big hero. Uh, an instrumental force in nationalism movements within Europe. I think he's an absolute stud of a person to study. So, he actually hates the idea of the parliament ruling, period. But he's also got no intentions of being Kaiser. All he wants to do is unite all Germans under one flag and one group and one credo, one language, one genius, one, ah, one Germany, right? So... He decides that he wants to return to the old monarchy, monarchy ways 
But he wants one that's like Machiavellian in a sense. He wants one that's approved by its people, right? He wants to try and find a way to make a state that's going to become powerful. And he's going to do it in less than 10 years, right? So one of his most famous quotes to come out of this is actually from a speech he gave. It's called the Blood and Iron Speech, right? So actually a lot of historians call it Blut Eisen because that's how you say it in German. I don't know why I said that aggressively. You can say German things really, really nice, like Blut Eisen. So now he said in his... Uh, Get out of that trash. Um, sorry. Uh, so, he said in one of his fam this famous speech, the great questions of the day, when he's talking about that, he's talking about German unification, will not be decided by speeches and resolutions. They will be decided by blood and iron. Now, in parentheses next to this, you can put on the other side, you can be like, obviously some wars are on the way, right? So he realizes one of our first steps in unification has got to be to get all these other Europeans out of our, like, out of our area. Get them out of here. So what he decides to do is he's going to make the Danes the first example. So, you don't know this, but Denmark owns two little places known as, where, that's not it, that's not it, oh, there it is. Two little places known as Holstein and Schleswig in the North German area, right? So remember when the Holy Roman Empire fell out and there were like 900 different principalities and a lot of the other Europeans were like, oh, I got this one, I got that one, got that one. They just started grabbing them up. Well, the Danes grabbed up Schleswig and Holstein, right? They're two North German provinces. Very, very wealthy, very, very strong. And do some Danes live there? Yeah, sure, some Danes live there. But do a lot of German landowners live there? Uh-huh. So, the big thing about it is the Schleswig and Holstein provinces are borderline feudal still, right? So, the Danes decide to try and take advantage of all the money coming from these German landowners. We're going to rewrite a constitution that brings them into our country in totality. So, they will become Danish states, okay? Well, Bismarck takes massive offense to this. And he tries to prove himself with the second Schleswig War, right? So he calls up Austria and he's like, yo, you want to get rid of some Danish people? And they actually respond with a positive and resounding yes, okay? So Austria goes in there to help them out and to strip these two provinces away from the Danish. Mm. Now, the Danes tried to bring them into their country and then they're going to lose in a war that lasts only nine months, right? Now, all three wars that he went into, bang, bang, quick ones, right? The Austrian ones, laughably short. Um, now, though, he's got a problem. So he gets rid of the Danes. The Schleswig Wars takes no time at all. Holstein and uh, Schleswig like, belong to German-speaking people again. But now he's got an issue. Now he's got an issue where it's like, obviously, German unification is on the way. Are we going to seek a greater Germany or a lesser Germany, right? The greater Germany would be the idea that Austria is at its reins, right? The idea that, uh, no, excuse me, that Prussia is at its reins. The greater German idea would be Prussia holds the reins of power. The lesser Germany idea, according to Bismarck, is that Austria holds the power. So according to Mr. D'Antonio, who said it so eloquently the other day at lunch, the unified Germany was coming. All right, especially after the second slice big war, right? Everyone knew it. Everyone saw it. Everyone saw it in the like tea leaves, if you will. A unified Germany was coming. Well, he wouldn't say coming. He would say coming. But yeah, but he said a unified Germany was coming no matter what. But now it's about deciding who's going to be in charge. The greater German idea with Prussia or the lesser German idea with Austria. Bismarck's about to prove that it's going to be Prussia. So he starts the Austro-Prussian War. Now some of you are like, why would you do this? They just supported you. Yes, they did just support them, but then they didn't want to back out of, like, of some of these other German states. They wanted to keep their hands in them, right? So the Prussians are like, we're going to remove you from North Germany altogether, and we're going to remove the Austrians. Y'all stay down in the South German area where you like belong, and stay down there with all the other Catholic states like Bavaria, right? So the Austro-Prussian War is somehow also going to be linked to religion and localization. Now, a lot of historians link it to religion because the Habsburgs are still devoutly Catholic whereas the North German Confederation is still devoutly Protestant and Lutheran, right? Also, a lot of people are like, well, heck, the Quadruple Alliance included uh, Great Britain, uh, Prussia, Russia, and Austria. Where was Great Britain and Russia in this whole thing? Why didn't they support somebody? Well, the British are kind of doing their own thing right now, and they're sitting on their island reaping the benefits of industrialization. They're just like, ah, go away. We don't care, right? They're the island. They're not the continent, so they stayed out of it. Also, a lot of people believe that... 
fear of just this growing continental powers were freaking them out a little bit, so they just stayed where they were. Now, the other ones, on the other hand, the Russians stayed out of it because of this thing that we'll talk about later called the Crimean War, right? So, the Crimean War, I don't know why I just started singing Crimea River in my head by uh, Justin Timberlake, but... Uh, the Crimean War was when Russia tried to annex this area of Crimea for away from the Ottomans. And the Ottomans are actually going to gain support from the Austrians and the Great Britain. And, oh, God. And the British and the French. And they're going to actually support them in keeping Russia at bay, right? Because Russia was growing in power. So the fact of the matter is, is Austria, you, they just fought a war against the Russians. They're not about to support. Uh, they're not about to get support from the Russians. Now, other people are like, well, wait, French is Catholic. Why don't the France, French support Austria? Well, the French just supported the Italians in a war against Austria to remove them from North Italy, not to mention the fact, too, that the French had just used a lot of resources in supporting Italy, so they're not about to do that either. So, Anyway, there's that localization aspect, so it's just Prussia v. Austria right now. Now, Austria does have a bigger military and things like that, but a lot of the historians link it to the fact that the Prussians were able to win so easily due to this thing called the breech-loading needle gun. One of the coolest inventions in military technology. It's actually called the Dreisa gun. Dreisa, named after the man who invented it, right? The Dreisa gun, as seen right here, is the first successfully battlefield-tested bolt-action rifle that the world had ever seen. Now, some of you are like, oh, modern weapons are on the way. This sort of, right? So the bolt actually comes back, and you have a paper bullet, right? A paper bullet cartridge. So there's a metal bullet on the inside of it. It's shaped like an acorn. And the barrel of this bad boy is rifle, which is another big-time development, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. You take the paper cartridge, you pull the bolt back, you slide that thing into the barrel from this position, okay? Hit your bolt back, go down, pull the hammer, up, bang. A trained Austrian could only fire one shot and reload in the same amount of time that an untrained Prussian soldier could fire five shots with this bad boy, right? So... The war's only going to last seven weeks. They completely mush them out of northern Germany, and they also just win a massive step in German unification. They create this thing called the North German Confederation. So, oh, put the North German. Don't put of the. That's dumb. Now, Austro-Prussian War. Prussia is absolutely going to overrun the Austrian Empire and push them out of the north altogether and force them to accept an armistice. Now, in this armistice process, some of you are thinking, are they going to be chill about it like they did with France after Napoleon, or are they going to be jerks about it? They decide to actually give them a generous one. They don't let, let force Austria to pay any reparations, so they're like, look, you lost. Just go home, all right? So they're like, we're not going to take any territory from you either, except the Italians are going to get a little touchy, and in 1866, they're going to take Venetia, which is where Venice is, um, because they actually supported the Prussians in this war. Uh, so they're going to support the Prussians. They're going to be like, whoa, 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 get them out of Italy, please. And so they actually just secede one little area in Venice, right? So... Austria also, though, is going to have to withdraw from German affairs completely. So now you got Austria out your business and staying over where Austrians belong in Austria, right? So now Bismarck has to decide how he's going to tame his parliament, right? So he's got this parliament that's full of all these middle class liberals, right? So the Bismarck decides that the old ideas of the old school monarchy, the head of state, the absolutism ideas, you're just not going to get them. All right, you're not going to get them, and you just got to get over it. Okay, so Bismarck knew that this idea of the absolute state had to meet somewhere in the middle with the liberal agenda of the middle class. Okay, so nationalism also he realizes isn't necessarily as destructive to the old conservative ways as like Metternich thought that it was. So Bismarck decides that due to the chaos of 1848, that middle class liberals could be led to prefer this. Like, we got to figure out a system in which they can prefer national unity. So let's give them some stuff, right? Bismarck is a genius. He looks at Napoleon III and he's like, wait, he made his middle class happy for like a hot second. And then he took power back, right? We should do that too. He used the French model, right? So Bismarck's going to write a constitution. Now in this constitution, it's going to be the constitution of the North German Confederation. He's going to do a lot of different stuff. The first three, he appeals to the liberals with. He goes, I'm going to let y'all consolidate these principalities into states, and they get to keep their local governments, right? Oh, the liberals are like, yes, I love that idea. Local governments led by the people. Ha ha ha. And then he's also like, I'll let all men over the age of 25 vote. And the liberals are like, Yes, we love it. We love it. We love it. Let's keep this thing going. And then he goes, lower house of the parliament, 
All of them will be elected by popular vote. The area where they pass tax law and laws and things like that, all popular vote. The liberals are just like comatose right now. They're so excited about this. But then he throws in two things. He says, I, the chancellor, Bismarck, am only responsible to the Kaiser. I don't answer to you guys whatsoever. And they're like, okay, fine. We don't want to talk to you anyway, right? So, and then he says, myself and the Kaiser have complete control of the military and foreign affairs. And they're like, okay. And they let them do that. The genius here in this whole idea is just like Napoleon III. Without a coup d'etat, though, Bismarck has just found a way to usurp the liberals, right? He can go straight to them through this method of popular vote if he decides to. Also, he can go straight to them through the military, right? Because remember, the common people love military victories, right? So the idea is that he's beating up all these people. The common people are going to jump on his bo boat anyway. So all the real power now lay with Prussia, its Kaiser, and its military. So now you've got to try and come up with a couple other things. One of his first steps is he gets them to pass a law called an indemnity bill that forgives them for their sins. Remember when I told you that they raise taxes anyway and double the size of the military without asking the parliament? They get them to pass a law that says we were okay with that. You see what winning a lot of wars does? Um, so the Franco-Prussian War is then going to break out, and it's going to be the last fail swoop swoop fail swift stroke in German unification. The problem, though, is leading into this war is that the German states in the south, like Bavaria, this big guy down here, and all these guys, they're Catholic. They like Austria. How are you going to get them on your side? Well, the one way to do it is to start a war with France and prove that if you're smart, you'll stay with us, right? So, Answer, war with France. Bismarck is going to taunt France into declaring a war on Prussia like a genius. Like, this guy is seriously the ultimate politician. He's better than Napoleon III, better than Napoleon I. He's amazing. So he causes, the, he figures out a way to cause this war in two ways. Number one, the first one has to do with the fact that the Spanish crown, okay, over in Spain, their ruler died without an heir, right? The closest living relative was a woman, that lady happened to be married, to a Hohenzollern, right? Married to a Prussian elite, okay? So that meant that at any day now, the next king of Spain was going to be a German, all right? So, oh crap. If you're France, remember these maps and stuff? You've now got Spain over here. You've got Germany over here. Well, from my side, it's actually Spain over here, Germany over here. They're about to be surrounding you. So the French actually go to the Spanish government they push this down. They don't allow them to elect this man as like an authoritarian king. And so Prussia acts a little pissed off. And then they send this thing called the Ems Telegram, right? EMS actually is short for a hotel resort where a French ambassador was staying, okay? <clears throat> so the Ems Telegram was originally written by a Prussian ambassador, kind of just stating how everything, they were just a little upset about the fact that a Hohenzollern wasn't taking the throne in Spain. But Bismarck is going to rewrite it, and he's going to send it on his own. And he's going to rewrite it so it sounds like they're insulting the French and calling them arrogant, right? So due to this, right, uh, he actually then takes that same telegram and publishes it in German newspapers, showing the Germans that, oh, look, we're making fun of the French. We don't even like those guys. And then the French are going to get super touchy about it and print it in their newspapers. And then the French people are going to push Napoleon III to declare war on Prussia, right? So war breaks out, but here's what crazy happens. The South German states support Prussia in totality because they feel like in this situation, France was being the aggressor. Genius, right? So the Germans overwhelm the French in no time at all. Napoleon III also decides, I'm going to lead my army because I'm big and bad and I have this fancy goatee. Well, bad idea. You are not Napoleon I, sir. You are a rookie at best. And he goes to this place called the Sedan, and he humiliates himself when he is overrun by a Prussian force and literally forced to surrender his sword and abdicate the French throne. So all the French people are standing there like, uh, 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 no, 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 no. We don't want him anyway. Keep him. We don't want him. He's not our king anymore. We're going to create this own little legislative thing that we have. And so the Prussians are going to, like, take and surround Paris and starve them out in seven months, right? The French surrender. Go figure, right? No, and you can't throw up barricades against a foreign or army. It's not how it works, weirdos. So Kaiser Wilhelm the First is going to walk his way into Versailles, and he's going to be be proclaimed the German Emperor of the German Empire now, because the South States have just joined the North. 
the German Empire, and he's going to do it in Napoleon's own house, in the Palace of Versailles, in the Hall of Mirrors. And how embarrassing is that? Now, keep in mind the way they dealt with the Austrians. They were like, you don't have to pay any reparations. Just give us Venice and back off, right? So they, however, forced the French to pay a reparation debt of 5 billion francs. To keep in mind, they were forced to pay, the Germans after World War I had to pay like something like two point something trillion dollars. So like in inflation dollars, five billion francs in the 1860s is a ridiculous amount of money, right? The French and the Germans are going to lead to a long-standing hatred of each other ever since this moment. But Bismarck has just successfully created the biggest and most powerful European state in less than a decade with three wars, right? Three massive victories and a lot of smart doings. Very good job, AP. Appreciate y'all hanging in there with me. I know this one was a little bit long, but you know what? You had a day off school, so enjoy yourself. I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a great evening.